Okay, well, welcome to the second part of the tutorial. If you haven't watched the first part, you don't need it. This can stand on its own. I may reference it from time to time, but not in any essential way. So in this part, I'll be talking about more applied aspects of category theory. Instead of inward facing into math, we'll be facing out into the world. So let's get started, let's see. Okay, so uh, the function of category theory in an applied setting, I think is really uh, for inter interdisciplinarity. So what is science? I mean, uh, who, who is it for me to say what science is? But I mean, from my point of view, what it is, is that we make these conceptual, like in our mind, we have an analogy of what's going on in the world. So we make a schematic idea that we're going to be looking at forces and masses and ways that we're going to measure those things. And we'll like kind of make an account, uh, a conceptual account of, of experience. And when, those exper when that experience is, is kind of uh, finely enough uh, understood or, or kind of sketched out as to what we're actually talking about and we re make it repeatable, we call it objective and we say it's an experiment. So, but, but we're just taking an account of some phenomena and kind of putting it into a schema. In engineering, we take these conceptual accounts and we use them somehow to channel world events. And it's kind of amazing that like what we, what's just in the mind can, can come back out and be useful um, in the world. But how, how do these different disciplines cohere? I mean, somehow it's like a, the same person can think in, you know, both about their regular life and about different scientific disciplines and they're using the same mind. So isn't there some sense in which all of these different accounts have something in common, the fact that at least that we can think about them, but maybe there's more to it. Um, uh, and, and I think to solve big problems, we need to connect these different approaches. And that's why you'll have a company or an organization with lots of different um, skill sets in it. And yet those people with the different skill sets do need to talk to each other. And so that's where interdisciplinarity comes in. And so we need some kind of shared fabric or substrate, something where this interdisciplinarity doesn't just occur within the English or you know, some other language, uh, but actually can descend into something as formal as the uh, conceptual accounts, the scientific accounts and engineering accounts themselves. So we want this effective analogy making. Analogies we might think of as like just to teach us something, we use an analogy like that, but, if, but maybe that analogy is actually rigorous enough to formalize and, uh, and thereby uh, have mathematics that controls or like allows us to think clearly, not just in one subject and another, but in, in between and to, to move the ideas from one to the other through these effective and formal analogies. And so maybe a better way to even say it would, we, we, we would be that we need a conceptual stem cell, something, some kind of conceptual thing that can differentiate into a huge variety of different forms like a stem cell. Uh, and then we would find the analogies between these forms as aspects within the stem cell. So your stem cells in, in a human say, differentiate into the brain and the liver and the circulatory system uh, all sorts of uh, other, you know, uh, differentiates into all these different things. And yet the fact that it comes from one single uh, stem cell um, means that there is some kind of, uh, we find the analogies and the connectors between the various systems in our body in the fact that they come from this unified origin. So category theory I'm proposing as a kind of conceptual stem cell. Um, it can differentiate into a large variety of different forms and as we've seen in the previous video, and we might briefly discuss it in this one, so there'll be a little more independent, uh, it differentiates into all sorts of forms of pure math, but it also form, differentiates into things throughout uh, science, so, or computer science, like databases and knowledge representation. And in blue, I have what kind of category theory you would find or use to talk about that. So categories and functors can be used to talk about databases and knowledge representation. Um, or functional programming languages where you look at Cartesian closed categories, or dynamical systems, or entropy, or collaborative design, or chemical reaction networks, or quantum processes. In each of these cases, there's some notion from category theory, like compact closed categories, that really explains a huge amount of um, the Hilbert space formalism. You don't need to know Hilbert spaces. You can kind of look at this, you can kind of look at the blue stuff, learn just the category theory, and see it applying to entropy or uh, diversity in populations or whatever. Now, maybe Karl Popper would say a theory that explains everything explains nothing. 
Um, and so how would we counter that? We'd say that and counter it in two ways. First of all, you could make the same objection about mathematics. Um, if math is the basis of hard science and used everywhere, uh, then does that mean that since it explains so much, it, it, it explains nothing? So category theory, just like math, explains and formalizes many, many things. And, and that doesn't mean that it doesn't explain anything. So what's going on? I mean, Karl Popper's idea has some sense to it too. So what's, what's the, you know, how do we resolve this paradox? I think it's that stem cells don't work until they differentiate. So if you take, you know, what math is uh, as a principle of say, um, some kind of linguistic representation of concepts where like the symbols you, are, you use to operate on those concepts follow the ways that the world that you're modeling um, with operations and, and things that you see going on there, then that very notion is not itself, that's just a stem cell. And same with category theory, whatever is behind category theory, this principle of looking at relationships instead of implementations, uh, that is just a stem cell, but it differentiates into these adult level cells. And it's the adult level uh, work, uh, the cells that do the adult level work. Like you have to differentiate, make special notation, make special techniques, et cetera, in order for math or for um, category theory to do the kind of adult level work that you would find there. But the unified origins, um, you know, the, the unified principles of math or of category theory lead to a, a interoperability within it. And I think because category theory is a tighter uh, stem cell, instead of like having lots of different, you know, it, maybe you would say life originated lots of times, uh, um, because category theory kind of originated once, um, it, it, there's something about it that's, that's just much more compact and, that, and it leads to an interoperability. I think category theory is the math of itself, of mathematics, or you could say it's mathematics self-aware in the sense that it's a branch of math, but it talks about all of math and it talks about itself. So there, if you saw the previous video, you'll you will see that there's a category of categories. So we're using category theory to talk about category theory. Um, we're using category theory to talk about math. So it was designed to transport theorems from one area to another, say from the, from the um, theory of shapes, topological spaces uh, to algebra. So you could take a space and um, turn it into some kind of algebraic object, a group, and then use this analogy uh, not only to think about shapes, but actually to prove things. So you could take facts that like, you know, one, one uh, group was different than another and use that to prove that one topological space must be different than another. So the analogy is rigorous enough that we can transport theorems through it. And I think uh, it, many people would agree that it's revolutionized, revolutionized pure math since its inception. And a great deal of pure math re research these days is written category theoretically. And it's become, category theory has become a gateway to pure math. So if you were gonna learn pure math, uh, I would suggest you start with category theory and then see it differentiating into all these different places. And of course, the purpose of today's talk, uh, the second part of this tutorial is to say that it's also branched out from math um, into databases and entropy and diversity and collaborative design and chemical reaction networks, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So, you know, this is a more outward facing talk saying why you might want to use category theory even if you're not a mathematician. And I think our historical moment here, we're in 2021 right now, and uh, it, there's something between the information revolution that's going on today and the industrial revolution. So in the industrial revolution, there was, people didn't really understand how to control or that they should control all the stuff and the runoff from their processes. So they're doing stuff that produced sewage that was running off in the streets and they hadn't yet produced, uh, invented sewers. They had runoff in the rivers, right? They weren't collecting the stuff that they were producing. They were just letting it fly out in any direction it wanted to go. And in the information revolution, we've got this big data where, you know, no one knows how to interpret anyone else's data. Um, it, the context is lost and there's no channels. Like, just like we didn't have channels here, we don't have channels here. So like when you want someone else's data, basically you might get it as a word file or, a, or an Excel file, but where the columns don't mean anything to you or something. And so it's as though Humpty Dumpty, this, the data was produced from 
something very intentional. And yet it's been broken up into a thousand pieces and we need to kind of reconstruct what they did. And so there's just these uncontrolled flows of information. And I think with category theory, we can better channel that information so that it's not, there's not so much waste. Let's get to specifics. What is the stem cell about? I guess one way to say it is it's about compositionality or compositional design patterns. So we're gonna focus on one called operads and it's the category theoretic formalization of operation when you do stuff to some stuff. Um, so this is a branch of category theory that well represents the spirit. And so this is a certain theme of design patterns and I'll talk about operatic things a lot today. And um, again, you don't have to have seen the first talk to, to understand this stuff, uh, although it would probably help. Um, so category theory is math for organizi organizing information and operads are a general framework for composable operation. So I'll sketch a definition and give a lot of examples. I'll talk about functors uh, between operads that connect different operation domains, like different ways that you can operate. And then I'll give an application to simultaneously solving solutions of different uh, of nonlinear equations, which might come up in solving systems of uh, finding steady states of differential equations and stuff like that. But um, so what I want you to consider though, is we're trying to find a science of interdisciplinarity and interoperability. If you wanted a science of it or a hard science, you would study different fields, different disciplines, and you would ask what sort of math can you use to connect these different disciplines? And the question is, does category theory, you know, for you to answer, does category theory fit the bill to connect different fields? Let's get into it with operads. Um, all right, so e pluribus unum, out of many one. An operation takes an arrangement of many sorts to produce one sort. <laughs> what is that talking about? It says if you've got a bunch of things of various sorts, you might be able to like look at them all and produce something else from them, okay? So you've got these things arranged. You've got these sorts, different sorts of things you're gonna be looking at. Uh, and uh, different sorts of dynamical systems or different sorts of tensors or uh, uh, different sorts of information. And then you're gonna arrange them. So, so someone comes to you and they say, oh, I've got all these dynamical systems and they're wired together somewhere. And somehow I've arranged a picture with some like pixels in it. And the whole picture is gonna itself be a pixel in some larger thing. So like, I'm gonna take pictures and make a new picture or something like that. So those are arrangements. I arrange the pictures to form a new picture, like a collage. And then uh, these arrangements can be nested. And that's what operations are for. Like when you think about plus and times, they're like, th there's only one sort maybe, like you have real numbers and you're gonna add them and subtract them and multiply them and divide them. And when you, th there's only one sort there, but there's like all sorts of arrangements of five plus nine minus six times four, right? And different arrangements, you'd still get another number out of them. And the nesting is what the is what we mean by compositionality. So we said compositional operations. The fact that you can nest them and you know keep making pictures of pictures of pictures. All right. So operads are used unconsciously, meaning they're all people are already using op operads. They just don't call them operads. And so um, right in electrical engineering, for example, we have wiring diagrams. People might draw wiring diagrams talk about Kirchhoff's laws or things. In design, you might have set-based design or in computer programming, data flow diagrams. In natural language processing, you have grammars. In material science, you have hierarchical protein materials. In information theory, you have Shannon entropy. And you might look at these like, what do all these have in common? What are these all examples of? And the answer is that there, there's an operat underlying all of these. And we wanna just bring that to the fore because, you know, if someone's only gonna work in electrical engineering, they might not need to know what an operat is, but if they're going to talk with someone in a neighboring field with a slightly different kind of wiring diagram, maybe heat flow or something, um, they might want to know like, well, they're not using the same sorts of diagrams I am, but there's a big analogy there. And they might want uh, tools for thinking about how those different worlds connect. So there's this common theme in the way we think throughout all these subjects and operads structure that sort of thinking. And it structures the way human minds think about concepts as like looking at the arrangement on your desk and seeing what it kind of means or something like that. 
that 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 like looking at arrangements and analyzing the gestalt of it or something is is what the operatic design pattern is supposed to model to kind of take a bunch of things in an arrangement and think of it as a new thing so let's look for sorts and arrangements and nesting in a bunch of examples so that's that's the operat idea is the, these kind of objects or sorts and arrangements or shapes or morphisms or whatever and nesting so kind of composing so we're going to look for that in a bunch of examples so here's an example this thing here is a picture of some nesting of arrangements of sorts okay so what are the sorts the so a sort here is a box with some ports on its left and right so this one is a is a uh, a sort it's a sort of thing the sort of thing that you could put in this box Okay, imagine a plug and play situation where you wanted to put things in boxes of this sort and boxes of this sort and boxes of this sort and get something in boxes of this sort. Well, this whole, the outer thing here is what I'm calling Y1, this box with two inputs and two outputs. And it's a sort, but this whole thing, uh, this diagram is an arrangement of three sorts in a sort. And this wiring diagram is an arrangement of two sorts in a sort namely the sort Y2, which has one input and two outputs. And Z itself is a, is a sort because it's got one input and two outputs. It's a sort of box, but I have arranged it. At, I've arranged Y1 and Y2 in it. Now, uh, here's another abstract view of it. Like the pink thing here is, uh, is a arrangement phi called phi1. I didn't label it here, but phi1 and inside it's like x1, x2, x3 are kind of inside it and y1 is outside of it. And x2, 1 and x2, 2 are inside of this yellow thing and y2 is outside of it. And now without even knowing what's inside these boxes, uh, y1 and y2 are inside a wiring diagram here. Even if these were blacked out or grayed out, you would still see them wired together somehow inside of Z and an arrangement there. So the arrangements here are wiring diagrams and then the nesting is the fact that you can put these two things together and you can compose, it's called composing or nesting and get this picture. And what I'm saying here is that I've kind of lost, I don't care about how you arranged it, arranged like the middle pieces and how you nested it. I put it all together. So X12, like, yes, it goes to X13, but it also goes to X21. And the fact that I could take like the outer arrangement and the inner arrangements and produce a single arrangement, a kind of parts explosion of all the little pieces inside the big piece is the operat. The, fact, the way we do that, what sorts are, what arrangements are, and what nesting does is uh, what makes the operat. <clears throat> so here's the formal definition. An operat consists of a set ob o. So if you saw the first uh, tutorial, an operat is kind of a generalization of a category. And so we've got a bunch of objects, but for this talk, since I'm looking outward facing, uh, I'm, I'm gonna think about how people would, might talk about them if they were seeing them uh, um, in another, oops, sorry, in another theory, another world. So I'm gonna call the objects sorts. You've got a set of sorts, and for every bunch of sorts, X1 through XK and Y that are sorts, you'd have a set of morphisms or arrangements or arrows from X1 through XK to Y. And so an element here would be called a K area arrangement um, phi that, that arranged X1 through XK in Y. And I might denote it this way. And so if you did see the first talk, if K was restricted to being one, this would just be an arrow from X1 to Y. And so categories are operads where every arrangement is only allowed to have one um, sort in, in the, before the arrow. So, uh, but the point is that so far an operat has a bunch of objects called sort, a bunch of things called sorts and some ways to arrange them that are known. That is what the operat is, is, is like the knowledge of what you want to allow as an arrow. And for every arrow, there's what's called an identity arrangement. And there's a nesting rule that says, if I've got some, if I've arranged X1 through X, you know, some, a bunch of X's in a Y and a bunch of other X's in another Y, I've arranged those two y's in the z, then I can think of uh, just the x's arranged in the z. And these need to satisfy unital and associative laws. Um, that, that like, 
composing with the identity doesn't do anything and stuff like that. Okay, so operad number one, we're gonna give a bunch of examples now, wiring diagrams. So the sorts were these boxes with ports, an arrangement with any wiring of X's in a Y, and the nesting is about this kind of fractal of like zooming in and in and in and seeing this all the way down um, arrangements or really kind of uh, um, uh, taking these things and kind of seeing them in Y. So just all these arrangements and how they nest. And so it W provides this control of, of flow operators and operations, like how things are going to move between stuff and you know, like what that does. So if I've arranged things like this and I've got some uh, machines in each of these, what does that do to create a machine here? Anyway, so the operator just, in this case, just the arrangements and we'll use them to think about the stuff flowing around and stuff. Here's a totally different operad, hierarchical protein materials. So you may have, may have no idea what a hierarchical protein material is, but there's an operad for them. A protein is an arrangement of simpler proteins. And there are these atomic proteins, amino acids, but protein materials, basically everything in your body that does anything cool is a protein. Um, for example, your skin is made of protein, it's made of collagen. And skin is stretchable, breathable, and waterproof. And material scientists would love to make materials as cool as skin. Um, and yet they don't, you don't need to go, you know, mine, you know, do a bunch of mining in some foreign country to get skin. You just have to eat like hamburgers or, you know, vegetables or something and you get something really cool. So what is it that makes us get this really cool thing from such simple materials? Like a fly eats, uh, sorry, a spider eats flies that are ubiquitous and yet makes spider silk, which is pound for pound stronger than steel. So there's all sorts of really cool materials made out of proteins that um, material scientists want to study. And so um, I worked with a material scientist named Marcus Bueller, uh, and we made a program that would use operads, um, along with uh, Ravi Jagadeesan and Tristan Giza, to, to uh, assemble new proteins from old. So um, what we did is we said, if you have any bunch of proteins, you could arrange them in series. You could kind of take a protein and attach it to another protein as long as the endpoints agree um, and you would get a new protein or you could have uh, put them in parallel with hydrogen bonds or you could arrange them in helices or double helices or any put them in any conceivable curve, et cetera. And so you can take, you can operate on a bunch of proteins and get a new protein. So collagen, what makes your skin has this nested structure. It's like a big array where of fibers and every fiber is a triple helix. I think a right-handed triple helix, which you can, if you're good at reading these things, this is a triple helix. And then each strand is itself a helix going the other way. So it's like we're nesting a helix inside of a triple helix. And the helix itself is a bunch of amino acids. So we're just building things up and up and up. Okay, operad three, probabilities. So even an operad with just one sort could be interesting. So let's consider the operad P for all probability distributions uh, on, a, on sets and we'll give it one sort E standing for event. So this operad has only one sort E, it's got events. But what matters then are the arrangements, how you arrange events in an events and how things nest. So a K, I'm defining this operad P to have a K area arrangement be any distribution of K events in an event. In other words, the K area operations from E, 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 E to E are all of the sets of numbers, all, all sequence of numbers X1 through XK, bigger than zero, that add to one. So coin flip is an arrangement of two events in an event. It is the, it is the event coin flip with a, a one half chance of a head event and a one half chance of a tails event. A die roll is an event then there's an arrangement, if your die is fair, of a one-sixth of one, one-sixth get a two, one-sixth get a six, et cetera. So a die roll is an arrangement of events in an event, and pick card is an arrangement of events, namely getting an ace of spades, getting a two of spades in an event, namely picking a card. Um, and the nesting rule is given by multiplication. So imagine you have an event called <clears throat> flip a coin and the result decides whether to roll a die or pick a card. So what am I saying here? It's got 58 events 
one event is you get a heads and then you get a, you roll a dice and get a one. Another one is you get a heads, roll a dice and get a two. Another one is you roll a, uh, get a tails and pick a card and get an ace of spades. And so this is an arrangement of all sorts of events that could happen in this game and the probability distributions of, their, of them. So that's an arrangement of events in the event, this kind of complex event. So we can nest these arrangements of events. So here's a lot more operads. Every context-free grammar is in, in an operad. So in this context-free grammar, these are the sorts. They're the parts of speech, like a sentence or a noun phrase or ver verb phrase. And the arrangements are production rules, they're called. So the fact that you can get a sentence by putting a noun phrase before a verb phrase. Uh, a noun phrase itself is an arrangement of simpler things. Uh, a pronoun gives you a noun phrase. So it's just this very simple one area arrangement, but also a determiner followed by a nominal gives you a noun phrase. And a nominal can be given by some arrangements. So just a noun, that's to, that counts as an arrangement that would give you a nominal, but so would a nominal plus a noun. And the nesting is the fact that you can build a sentence up from very simple things uh, um, by nesting, like inside of noun phrases, like the, one of these things, etc. So the operad of sets is another operad. Um, it's surprisingly, it'll be important in the, what's to come. The, uh, the sorts in set are the sets. Red, green, blue is a sort. The naturals is a sort. R2 is a sort. And an arrangement is a function that takes, um, when I want to arrange x1 through xk in y, it's really just a function from x1 times x2 times xk to y. And nesting is composition. And so if you think of sets as features you could sort into, like you look at something and you say, oh, that's red or that's green or that's uh, 52 years old or you know, that's at certain position. You're sorting the things on your desk into uh, their color or their age or their position on your desk. And that's like a feature you could add to one of your objects on your desk. And an arrangement, well, I guess I'm not looking at the arrangement on my desk right now. What I'm saying is, um, an arrangement in this abstract sense is that if I have a k-dimensional feature space where I take the age and the color and this position of something, I could map that into a single dimension where I characterize it as good or bad, say. So that's another set, good, bad. And given red, green, blue, natural number, and R2, I would get good, bad, like whether I want to move it or not. And that would be an arrangement. It's kind of a kind of very abstract arrangement, but it's like, uh, it's the arrange, it's the system I have for classifying, taking my k many classification and getting a single classification or judgment of whether I want to move it or not. Now, there's a lot more operads that were similar to my first operad, namely, here are some different. These are not operads; these are characteristic or representative arrangements from each of them. So, here. Uh, um, I have the sort of arrangement you would find in an operad where like you could have more general, like what is this an example of? I'm basically trying to show like sequences of boxes in series. And this one I'm showing sequences of boxes that could be in parallel or series. And this one I'm showing sequences of boxes in parallel and series with feedback. And in this one I'm showing boxes, but they're not really in any kind of sequence. They don't have input and outputs, they just kind of have ports and you get another box of ports. Um, in each of these cases, like you'll see that the outside thing looks a little bit like the inside thing, right? Um, and so uh, in each of these cases, like this one, um, the we're putting things together, but the things themselves seem to have one output and possibly many inputs and you get something of that same sort of shape. And so these are characteristic like arrangements you might find in a bunch of different operads different rules for what a sort is allowed to be. Can it have multiple inputs and outputs or not? Can they be arranged in series or, just, or parallel? Can they have feedback? Those choices decide uh, what operad you're looking at. Okay, and then there's functors connecting operads and that's our next goal, talk about that. So we've seen lots of different operads, wiring diagrams, protein material sets, probabilities, grammars. A functor from one operad to another is a translator. It take, it's like a map from one grammar to another, like a compiler, or a way to take one wiring diagram and translate it into another kind of wiring diagram. Um, functors from O, any old operad you want, to set 
are special in the fact in the sentence that we're going to be looking at them with special attention they, and they get a special name they're called o algebras a functor from o to set is called an o algebra that's our next thing we'll talk about they really operationalize or actualize you know they, they make the opera do something it's not just a picture anymore or like a just abstract arrangements it's now arrangements that do stuff and so what's the difference between an opera and an algebra it's the difference between the rules of composition and the stuff that's following those rules, the stuff being composed. So if you know group theory or ring theory, if you don't, don't worry about it, but operad is to the theory of groups as algebras are to groups themselves. So the theory of groups is, I'm going to be interested in sets with an operation and an identity and inverses. And algebras are, here is one. So it's like operads are to the theory of rings as algebras are to individual rings. So operad is a theory and algebra is a model of that theory. Okay, so any operad has lots and lots of algebras associated to it. Only some of them might be interesting to us, but there's infinitely many. So O is like a theory of composition. What are the sorts? What sorts of elements will I be looking at? What are the operations on those elements? What kind of laws do they satisfy? And O algebra is a model of that theory. If I have an A as a functor from O to set, it's going to tell me what's actually being composed. So a functor from O to set will assign to every sort in O a set, which is a sort in set, of, oper of, of elements. So it's going to say, oh, when you draw that picture of a box, here is the set of things that I imagine putting into the box. It's a set of elements that that box is supposed to be the set of elements of that sort. An arrangement says, if I have an arrangement here, if I have a functor, it turns it into a K area operation. So if I had an arrangement like a wiring diagram or something of a bunch of boxes in a box, then A of phi would take that arrangement and turn it into one of these thingies, a function from A of X1 times A of X2 times A of XK to y, A of Y. It would take an element of each of these sorts and produce an element of this sort. The arrangement would be enough to give us a formula for that. And if we know how to take every sort and give ourselves a set of elements of that sort, and if we know how to take every arrangement and give ourselves a function of this kind, then we will have given, as long as it satisfies, you know, rules of identity and composition, it will give us a functor. It will give us an algebra. And we will be able to translate our abstract sorts and arrangements into concrete sets and, and functions. So what does this really look like? Well, we had this operat of all boxes. Here is one arrangement of x1 through xk in y. And uh, I didn't write it to avoid clutter, but you could imagine every, um, every wire here labeled by a topological space as though there was signals passing here. So there's this sort of signal passing into X1 and this sort of signal passing into X1, this sort of signal passing out of X1. Now there's many different algebras with, even if you label these guys, right? You label all the wires. Here are some algebras. Open dynamical systems would be a, a machine with ports. So it's like in this box, what set do I imagine going in here? Like what am I allowed to pop into this X? Any dynamical system whose input output space, whose input signals and output signals are according to um, this, th these ports here. So if I had a dynamical system of some kind of state space, something running around through a state space, getting signals in, moving through state space, pumping signals out, et cetera, and I had this arrangement about how those signals were gonna flow, then I would get a big dynamical system in Y that took those input signals here and running a bunch of stuff around produced output signals there. So I can actually turn ordinary differential equations in each of these boxes into an, a system of ordinary differential equations here. So if I put systems of ODEs in each of these, I get a system of ODEs out and that is how I get my functor. But in fact, there's many different algebras here and like there's infinitely many, but three that I can tell you right now. One is continuous dynamical systems right, systems of ODEs with time varying parameters, like the input parameters come in, it goes through some, you know, uh, goes through some differential equation, some trajectory and spits out some, some stuff that go into other things. 
but you could also have discrete dynamical systems. Instead of differential equations, you just have like um, something on a clock, right? Where there's just a set of possibilities in the state space and a new input element comes in on each of these wires, updates and sends some stuff out. Or there's hybrid dynamical systems which show up in like robotics. Um, and all of these, these are three different algebras on this three different semantics for the same sort of syntax. But in fact, there's a much simpler algebraic algebra, like kind of coming from algebra, like, well, linear algebra, in fact. So we said that this thing is modeled by dynamical systems, that those give algebras, but in fact, there's another algebra that's not dynamic at all. You could put a tensor, namely just an array of numbers in each of these boxes. So if, if you have a box with like two inputs and two outputs, just put a four-dimensional tensor into this box, a four-dimensional array into this box. And what you'll get is uh, you'll get a tensor on the outside. And so this wiring diagram becomes a tensor network and we contract along shared wires to compose. Later, I'll give it uh, a relationship between dynamical systems and tensors. Okay, so let's go through an example of this sort of thing, the pixel array method. Now imagine, this is kind of a real world application in some sense. So imagine uh, you plot the solution to two different, two different equations, f of xw equals zero and g of wy equals zero, it's arbitrary equations. And you plot each in a bounding box from negative 1.5 to 1.5. And then we consider plots as matrices of these on off pixels of Booleans. Okay, now what's funny is you can multiply the matrices to solve the system. So if I plot x squared equals w and one w equals one minus y squared, plot these two things. If I intersect these plots, I get like two points. But if I multiply these as matrices where white is zero and black is one, I actually get the correct answer. I get this circle. This is just the matrix product. And it is the solution to x squared equals one minus y squared, x squared plus y squared equals one. And so like these equations here aren't even differentiable or even defined everywhere. They're kind of got logs and co uh, hyperbolic cosines and tangents. But if you wanted the simultaneous values, uh, values of W and Z where simultaneous uh, solution exists, you could multiply these three matrices, the plots and get this matrix. And you would see all of the spots where, where, the where there is a solution. Whereas Newton's method would just kind of give you one dot, one black spot somewhere. This gives you all the solutions at once. Um, so for an arbitrary system of equations, like maybe like this, where I've bolded the variables I care about exposing, I wanna know the simultaneous solutions where there exist some values of the, all the variables, but I just care about T, V, and Z. Um, I would draw this wiring diagram and it has the F1 includes variables T, U, and V, and F2 includes variables V, W, and X. And I'm, it just kind of puts them all together. You can see here that Y is only used once right there. And so what we're looking for is all the T, V, Z triples for which there exists values of the other things that make all four things zero. Now some very like, you know, multiplying matrices would have a picture here or the Khatri Rao product, which I hadn't really heard about until I thought about this stuff or the trace of a matrix or the Hadamard product or the Kronecker product or marginalizing out a certain variable. All of these have wiring diagram pictures. Now, the pixel array method is not too important to us, but it does have some good ac accuracy guarantees of no false negatives, does have false positives, but as the pixel density goes to zero, these go to, you get no po false positives. And it's faster than Newton style methods if you want all the solutions in a bounding box. And you can use it to find the steady states of different, of dynamical systems. So for example, we could find the steady states of dynamical systems as in follows, we would put dynamical systems in each of these boxes. We would convert these boxes into just circles with ports. And then that's like this map here of functor from one operad to another. We have the pixel array method going here. We have the dynamical systems algebra going here. And we would put what's called a natural transformation of steady states into this box, into this here. And this is a category theoretic you know, diagram that says the following thing. It says that, do I say this on the next slide? What it says is that um, if you want to put these dynamical systems together and find their steady states, uh, it's the same thing as finding the steady states of each of them 
and then composing according to the pixel array method. So what just happened? I mean, I talked about a lot of stuff and it's hard to know like, what, you know, was that math or David Lynch film? Basically, you know, it's, it's, there's a lot going on there, but we talked about operads, this language for composable operations. We talked about wiring diagrams, grammars, protein materials, sets, probabilities. We talked about morphisms between operads or what's called functors that translate from like this boxy language to this circle language. We talked about functors to set and dynamical systems and tensors and different systems of equations and how they all relate. And we talked about maps between functors, which are the natural transformations that let us turn steady states of dynamical systems into tensors. Um, so the point was just to give an, a glimpse into the applications of category theory, a simple principle, namely operations, but formalized mathematically. And we saw lots of different examples of it and like a web of interconnections. And again, it's just part of a larger theory, category theory, which has formalized the principles of math in math, space and measure, and operations, symmetry, equivalence, syntax, all sorts of common things we see throughout math put together into this. And we saw some of these ideas in the previous tutorial. So I think looking outward, the science of interdisciplinarity can reduce waste and that models of different systems need to be independent to optimize, but they need to be interoperable to work together. And so interdisciplinary, uh, interdisciplinarity has the capacity to model both of those and therefore be a foundation for this kind of science. Okay, well, thank you.